Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in today. My name is Brenna Marsicek. I'm the Communications Director for Madison Audubon, based in Madison, Wisconsin. This spring, instead of hosting our typical in-person birding related classes, we are offering them online. So this video tutorial is intended to teach you how to use the eBird website, uh, specifically the website, not the uh, phone app and give you an overview of the amazing assets and features of this website. Uh, hopefully some of the benefits of doing it this way is that you can go at your own pace, you can pause, rewind, watch again and again if you want to, and um, really take your time with learning this tool. Thank you to Kyle Lindemer, our volunteer who put together this tutorial. And if you have any questions, please feel free to visit our website at madisonaudubon.org. Thank you. Welcome to Madison Audubon's Learning the Ropes of eBird. My name is Kyle Lindemer, and I'll be presenting today's course. A little background on me. I started birding in Iraq in 2009. When I came back to Wisconsin in the spring of 2010, I started attending several Madison Audubon field trips. I started using eBird at that time. It became a great resource for me to use in the field, and over time, I was asked to become one of Dane County's eBird reviewers. Since then, I've done a variety of Madison Audubon field trips and do a variety of bird-related volunteer activities. Let's get started. The first thing you want to do is put eBird.org in your browser window, and if you haven't created an account, you'll want to create an account. So what you'll do is you'll slide over the Create Account tab and click on it. You'll enter your first name, your last name, you'll choose a username, you'll choose a password, you'll enter your email address, and you'll hit create account. If you already have an account, just click sign in. So enter your username, and then enter, enter your password, and click sign in. So this page brings up your current stats with your species observed, your total checklist, your species with photos, your species with audio, and your checklist streak. The first thing we'll wanna do is go to your profile. If you go click on your name and click profile, you'll be able to get a visual rep representation of what is shown out in public eBird. So, I currently have my picture, I have a public profile, shows that I'm a regional reviewer for Dane County, Wisconsin. It says how long I've been using eBird, what my oldest checklist is, and my oldest media is. It also shows your latest checklist, your latest photos, and your latest audio. So from here, if you don't want a public profile, you can go to edit profile, you can add a photo if you'd like, you can add a website if you'd like, you can put an about you in there, you can put what region you use most, you can also reset to, to, to the world, the state, the country. You can choose to make your profile not public and you can choose to not show your latest checklist. When you're complete, hit save. So now, this currently is zoomed in on Dane County. It has my number of species observed in Dane County, my total checklist, my species with photos, and my species with audio. You can change the region by dropping down to the change region and entering a specific county, state, province, country, whatever it may be, or you can zoom out. So I can zoom out to Wisconsin and maybe zoom into Columbia County and see the same information. I can also zoom out further to the country click on my California list and see where I bird in California and see individual locations for California. You can also zoom back out to the world and do the same. So it goes in the complete checklist, species observed, species with photos, species with audio. If you'd only like to see your countries with species with photos, just click on that and now it'll just show your places that have photos. So for instance, for Australia, in Victoria, I have photographed six species. So you can see the latest ones from 
from there, including singing, honey eater, hooded plover, etc. So now the contacts tab, I'm not going to click on because mine actually has friends whose personal email and usernames are on there, but that's a good place to use for when you're sharing your checklist. If you have the eBird username, which mine is blackbird17, or the person's email address they use for eBird, you can enter them in your contacts. And when you're entering checklists later to share, uh, that's where that comes into play. The preferences tab, you can change from common name English, for instance, to common name English UK, which is different in the system, or to any other language you're using that might make things easier for you. You can also change the scientific name or both for displays. Uh, as far as your name going out in public, uh, when eBird alerts go out, it will normally default to your name. If you don't want your name going out on those eBird alerts, you can always go to anonymous eBirder and it'll come out as an anonymous eBirder when it goes out. The reviewer still has access to your actual name. Uh, then for data privacy, you can put hide my data from recent visits, hide my data from eBird alerts, hide my data from top 100, or hide my checklist comments. Uh, normally in my checklist comments, I like to put some specific details as to where I saw some certain birds and everything that are mainly just for me that I don't want to share with people in the public. I like to keep my name in the top 100, keep my name in the alerts that go out so people can see immediately where I saw things. And recent visits just keeps people from being able to search if I was at a hot spot recently and going through all my stuff. I also have notifications set to notify me anytime someone shares a checklist with me. When you're complete with that, you can hit save changes. Cornell lab account. This is what the eBird reviewer will see uh, when, he, when he looks at your profile. I just have my name, my zip code, United States. You can add everything. It's not really necessary. You can also change your email address, change your password in here. And this shows you right here what your eBird account gets you into. So it gets you into Project Feeder Watch, it gets you into the Great Backyard Bird Count, etc. We'll go back here. And then obviously sign out is signing you out of your eBird. So we're gonna kind of work some of these tabs backwards. So first there's the help tab. So there's a lot of good stuff on how to use eBird in general, how to use eBird mobile, what the protocols mean, whether you're stationary or traveling or doing a pelagic protocol, for instance, how to add photos and sounds, how Cornell uses your media, how to rate photos in the Macaulay library, how to do bird counts, how to accurately estimate bird counts, entering checklists, sharing checklists, all kinds of stuff that I'm going to cover today. This is basically what's in here. It's got frequently asked questions. It's got the Merlin Bird ID app if you're if you're using that. So this is a good wealth of resources. If you can't find something, you can actually type in here and search out what you're looking for. And then uh, from there, hit search and see if it'll help you out. So we'll go back from here. News is just basically eBird news. There's eBirder of the month. There's monthly eBird challenges on here. There's how to win some stuff, as you can see. Here's the March eBird challenge. Lots of things you can do on there. Good, good stuff to read if you have time. The About tab, basically just about eBird, about Cornell, uh, resources available. Science tab, this is showing what eBird's doing with all the millions of records that are in there showing distribution, it's showing breeding, it's showing status, it's showing all kinds of good stuff. You can type in any species in here. You can say a yellow rumped warbler, for instance. And you can find its abundance map. You can find its animation. This is through the year, as you can see down the corner here. This is where they are each week of the year, basically. Very cool stuff with many different bird species in here. So back to the science. Here's how to download some of the data products that they have available. 
if you want to use it for science, how you, how you can use it for science, conservation impacts, other projects, etc. Let's start with how to actually submit a checklist. So you go up here and you hit submit. So then from there, you need to pick a location. There are many different ways to pick a location. This drop down is all my previous locations. So every time you hit a, hit a location, it saves it, whether it's a personal location or whether it's from a hotspot. As you can see, I have quite literally hundreds in here from all over the world. The other way is to find it on a map. So if you know what county or know what state you're in or province or country, you can find it that way. So let's say I'm in Minnesota. I don't know what county I'm in and I'm not quite sure where I'm going. So I can just type in Minnesota. Click on Minnesota. Shows me the whole state. So these red dots are basically kind of like regional hotspots. So it's going to zoom in for that for you. And all the blue dots are actually my personal locations that I've used. If we zoom in on these, it's going to slowly show you the hot spots around there. So if you know you're right around this lake and you don't know what the lake's called, click on that, it says Lake Pulaski, and you can hit continue, and that starts your checklist. If you have a GPS, you can do create using lat latitude, longitude, you can type that in, hit continue to start your checklist there. Select an entire city, county, state, country is actually not the best way of doing it, but I'm gonna put it in here just to show you how it's done. If I wanna hit Dane County, for instance, hit continue. It's picked my location as Dane County. Uh, that is not very accurate, and eBird will actually hide that out from out output if you put that. So not the best option for you, but it is available. Or you can import data from another location. Probably the best way to, to do it is if you know, know where you're at, just find it on the map. We'll enter Dane County because that's where we are. Click that. The red will zoom in on, on your county hotspots. So we'll zoom in toward the isthmus. As you can see, there's quite literally tons of hotspots. You can hit the plus to zoom in further. Let's zoom in, say, toward Picnic Point. Out at UW Lakeshore Preserve, you actually have University Bay. You have Picnic Point. You have the class of 1918 Marsh. You have Bill's Woods. UW Lakeshore Nature Preserve General. Use whatever you're closest to or whatever is most accurate for you. If none of these things work out for you, you can create a personal hotspot. What you would do is click somewhere else on the map, drops a green pin, and then you're gonna have to name it. You can type in Picnic Point, hit continue. Because Picnic Point's here and there's a close hotspot to it, I, I won't recommend doing that. If it is a new place, you can hit suggest as a burning hotspot and then continue. And a hotspot editor can actually look at that and determine if that's going to be one of those little red pins. Best always name them properly and be accurate with it. If there's already several out there, such as there is for UW Lakeshore Preserve, I probably won't add any more. It's just a pain and overburdens the system. So let's just say we're going to start today and we're going to start at University Bay. There's lots of waterfowl out on the bay right now. Let's, let's bird there. So we hit continue. So now you're going to pick the date. Today for me is March 20th. You can enter any day in the past on there. You can enter anything you need. Traveling is if you're walking a trail, driving a refuge loop, field birding, basically you're moving the whole time. It's important to note that traveling checklist shouldn't be more than five miles. And you should start a new checklist anytime you leave a specific habitat or a specific location. Your start time, I have a 24 hour clock. You can change it to 12 hour clock. So our start time, let's say, is 12.05 p.m. Duration is hours and minutes. So let's say we did it for an hour and five minutes. 
distance, you can do miles or kilometers. If you have something like a cell phone that tracked your distance, that's probably best to use. Otherwise, you can estimate it. It's meant for one-way distance if you're going out and back. If, you use, if you're using a loop, you can go the entire distance. So let's say we did an out and back on a trail. We went out a mile and we came back a mile. And then party size is how many people were burning in your party. Let's just say there were two of us. Checklist comments are meant for if you have you want to talk about the weather, snow depth, something like that. It's not really for the birds you're seeing. It's more for, for other things about your day. Uh, your next option is stationary. Stationary is a fixed location, watching from a window, hawk watching, sea watching, maybe scoping over the University Bay there. It just has for start time, duration, party size. Historical is meant for a time where you can't estimate the start time, duration, or distance, but you kind of know your day. So we can still pick our March 20th of 2020. Reality, you know, you might want to look back and say, oh yeah, I saw a rare bird on March 20th, 2018. You can try to estimate, but it's not required. Incidental is for when birding was not your primary purpose. So you're sitting in the garden and you hear a couple of sandhill cranes fly over and you want to enter those into a checklist. That's a good, good place to do incidental. I also do incidental driving down the road. If I see a red tail hawk or see a snowy owl on, on the side of the road, I might pop an incidental checklist in there. You can put start times, start, start times are not required. Other options are area, banding, pelagic, nocturnal flight call count. You can see there's piles of stuff on here. These are very specific, especially like eBird pelagic protocol. You need to be five miles offshore. It can only be for so many minutes. If you go in the eBird help, you can look this stuff, stuff up and see how to use those. But for the most part, you won't use any of these right here. So let's go back. We're going to say we did a stationary count. We did it for 30 minutes. There are two of us. We're looking over University Bay. So let's hit continue. So all the birds that currently pop up are what are likely at the area you chose at that time of year. There are eBird filters that someone works on very hard to make sure they're as accurate as possible. There's always going to be birds out of season. Not all these birds will be here right now, but they are species that are expected to be here this time of year. So I have it with subspecies on. You can turn subspecies off. So instead, we have greater white fronted goose right here. If you have subspecies on, it'll give you the greater white fronted goose western. You need to be careful using subspecies, especially if you can't identify them. For instance, let me go down to yellow rump warbler here. Yellow rump warbler, there are occasionally Audubon yellow rump warblers in Wisconsin. If you're not sure, just use yellow rump warbler versus myrtle in case it was an Audubon. You can group by most likely. So that puts the most frequent on top, still in taxonomic order, the least frequent, and the not reported. So for instance, it's saying snow goose has not been reported this time of year on University Bay. This helps, especially if you're learning birds, you're not sure if you saw a certain species, the most frequent, you're very likely to see out there. The infrequent, possibly, the not reported, very unlikely. So we'll go, we'll take that back off. Let's just say we're out on University Bay, kind of know what's out there today. So we'll say there were 125 Canada geese, maybe four wood duck, maybe we saw two blue winged teal, maybe 30 northern shoveler, 10 gadwall, let's call it three widgeon, maybe 22 mallard so on and so forth just just go on to what you see well let's say we saw a eurasian widgeon today well that's not on here you're not gonna be able to find that so what you can do is hit add species and we can type in
Eurasian widget. Immediately says it needs details. It's a rare bird for this area. They do come through here on occasion, but it's rare. The best way to add details is to add media. In this case, if you took a photo, we can add media later and then upload that in. If you don't have a photo, you need to add some text to describe the bird, its habitat and its behavior. Be specific. You need to say its coloring. You need to say its size. You need to say its shape. You need to differentiate that it's a duck and not a shorebird. You need to describe habitat. You need to describe why you thought it was this bird over the other bird. For instance, greater and lesser scop are both seen in Dane County, but lesser scop are way more prominent. So greater scop actually flag is rare. You need to describe why it was greater and not lesser and describe the difference of the two. I'm just going to type something in there so we can continue. So in this case, we'll say it's continuing. Maybe it's been seen multiple times in the last week. You can put age and sex if you know it. If you don't know them, leave them blank. Breeding codes are the same way. Wisconsin just completed its breeding bird atlas. You're welcome to put breeding codes in if you know what you're using them for, but otherwise it's it's nothing you need to put in there. Oil birds, this is mainly for the Gulf Coast when there was the BP oil spill. There's really no reason to put in those codes either. So we'll check that we know that's that's rare. And we'll we'll keep going. So maybe we saw a couple of hooded mergansers too. So okay, now we're done. At this point, it's going to ask us if we're completing a complete checklist of everything we were able to identify today. We'll say yes in this case. Everything we were able to identify, we put in there. It can be no. No is not the best for scientific purposes. Let's just say that Eurasian widgeon had been there a couple days and you just want to go see that Eurasian widgeon. You can put just the Eurasian widgeon in and then you can say no to complete an entire checklist and then you're going to hit submit i'm actually going to change this up hit submit real quick and then delete it so it doesn't go out in the alerts so i'm just going to put test not real so in case it does go out into the alerts we don't get people going to picnic point here in a minute we'll hit submit shows everything observed if you want to add media to that eurasian widgeon hit add media We'll say we want to add to the widgeon. We'll hit add media again. It's going to ask me where I want to get it from. So you can go to wherever you store your photos. You can click on it. We'll hit choose. It's a picture of my wife, not a bird. It's going to work through the process of adding it. And that's done. It's in your it's in your checklist. We're going to hit done here. I'm going to go into my eBird manage my checklist and I'm going to click delete this checklist before it goes out. So that's how you submit a checklist. Then if you go to my eBird right here, it's going to show you your life list. I have them taxonomic. You can change them to alphabetic. You can change them to by location. You can change them to state or province. So mine starts with Australia, goes down to China, Costa Rica, etc. You can change them by date. So I've got date ascending. Click it again, it's date descending. You can also see all the observations you've had of that bird. So for instance, I just got Island Scrub Jay on Santa Cruz Island last month. I've only got one of those. I can go back. But let's say California Thrasher, for instance. I go view all. I've got four different 
California Thrasher observations. Go back there. Go back to my eBird. So besides your life list, it's got a year list, a month list, total checklist. Ticks are basically how many of those birds you've got in different areas. You can go major regions. So world, Western Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, North America, South America, the AOU, the American Birding Association, Lower 48. You can see all the different areas where your life list is. You can go by state province. So I have 299 Wisconsin life birds or 86 this year. You can go by county. There's my counties with the highest number down to my counties with the lowest number. In addition, you can summarize my observations. You can do a report for a week, a month, a year. You can do specific time frame. So I'm gonna do a month report on January 1st of 2020. Hit continue and you can click all your locations. You can click multiple locations if you need to. Hit continue. And this will tell you with each period, how many birds you saw and how many checklists you reported those birds on for each of those bird species. You can go to abundance, go frequency, go group sizes, so my average Canada goose group size was about 25. My average tundra swan group size was seven. My average mallard group size was 200. Then you go total of those species for the entire time for those weeks. Go back. Back to my eBird. Manage my checklist. From here, viewer edit. So this was a checklist I had today. This is what I saw. I can remove stuff from there. The review is actually something you won't see. This is just for eBird reviewers. You can add media back to it from here if you forgot to add media before. You can edit species, which means you can add stuff in or remove them if you need to. You can hit save when you're complete. back from here. Also for manage my checklists, you can share with any of your contacts or you can add them in or you can delete the entire checklist from here. Probably not the best idea. Then you can see your shared checklist. These are people who have shared checklists with me. They created it. They shared them with me. You can manage your locations. This goes into that first part where you were under submit and you have the drop down of all your locations. You can show what's there, what's not. All mine are showing. You can actually click them and mark it so they're not showing in there. So you can rename it if you want to put a name on this area. You can move it if you want to move the point somewhere else. Uh, you can merge it with another location. This works really well if, say, you found a bird and then other people start going there and a hotspot was created for there, you can, you can merge your locations with the hotspots. Import data, you can use that if you have spreadsheets of eBird data, you can import from there. Manage import data, I don't really do a lot of this stuff, so, I don't have a lot of understanding on that. You can click on those and play with them. Yeah, I don't have anything to, to play with for imported data. Download your data. And it'll send an email with all your stuff to you within 24 hours. And then manage my alerts. We'll actually go over alerts here in a few minutes. So that's basically what my eBird is. So now explore. 
So Explore has some really cool features, especially for when you're traveling. So you can explore species. So for explore species, let's type in a bird I saw in New Zealand. It's the South Island Robin. So we'll click on that. So first thing it comes up with is photos of the bird. If you look here, this is actually a picture I took a couple years ago. Ebert's got me credited down there. We'll X out of that. It says I've seen it and I have a photo of it. I don't have audio of it. I don't have it for this year. You can listen to it. You can see its range, which is only in the South Island of New Zealand. You can see I've got two observations of it. There's 3,754 in eBird. I've got an observational photo, and there's 327 of those in eBird. You can see the latest photos of the bird. You can see the latest audio of the bird, and you see the latest videos of the bird. It's kind of a cool feature to look at. So now we'll go back. So now let's look at species maps. So you can click species map here. Let's type in a species that, that migrates a little bit. So let's type in Baltimore Oriole. So this is the entire range of the Baltimore Oriole year round. Let's say we just wanna see where they are in the winter, for instance. So we'll click here. So you have, it's showing year round all years right now. You can go to year round past 10 years or year round the current year. Let's say we wanna look for them in the winter though. So let's look for December through February for all years. So we'll set range. And as you can see, most of them are in Central America and the Southeast United States with very few up in Wisconsin area. So let's say we want to see them just for this winter. So go down here and we'll change this to January and February of current year. We'll hit set date range. So now that zooms into where the Baltimore Oriole has been reported this year and only this year. So let's see the spots up here toward the Great Lakes. It looks like there's one here in Wisconsin. You can zoom in right here with the plus sign, and then you can drag on the map. Drag on the map again, or you can just double click, and it zooms in. Let's say we want to see the actual point of where that is. You can go over here and say show point sooner. That gives me a point, so let's keep zooming in on it. So let's say you want to see the details on this bird and when it was seen, where it was seen. So you can click the little blue point and you can see that it was seen on January 1st and January 3rd of this year. If you want to see their actual checklist, you can click on the date. It shows you the checklist. Baltimore Oriole is a rare bird for that time of year. It should probably have details in there. My guess is it was actually seen at the end of 2019 and was continuing and the reviewer just approved it based on that. So let's zoom out on this. Let's say we only want to see birds that have either audio or photos with them. So let's click explore rich media. So now it only shows points that have media with them. The P is for photos, V is for videos, A is for audio. Here's a bird in Northern Indiana that has a photo on it. So we can click on that. It was reported by Indiana Audubon on January 13th of this year. It says it has a photo there, so let's click on it. We open it up and it's got photos here. So if you click on the photo, it'll actually show you from Macaulay Library. It's not a great quality photo, but it doesn't matter. It shows that it is indeed a Baltimore Oriole. So we can go back. In addition to being able to show rich media, you can change the way the map set up. Right now, it is set up for a hybrid map. You can go just terrain map. You can go street view map. It's got all the roads on it. You can go with satellite imagery, or you can go with hybrid like what it has. So let's go back to Explorer again. And you can go search photos and sounds. You 
this is just giving you all the latest photos that were submitted into eBird that are showing the Macaulay Library. Let's say we want to look for a certain species though. So let's just say, how about a Ross's goose? Type Ross's goose in there. It says there's about 20,500 photos of Ross's geese in there, 59 with audio and 34 videos. You can filter them by location, date, contributor, and other things, but it shows all the photos with Ross's geese. You can click on them, see them up close, see it's a Ross's goose, obviously. Target species. This is good if you're going somewhere else. So let's say I want to go to Fiji. Type in Fiji. Let's say we're going to go in May, which is definitely not going to happen this year. So change that to May. May. And this is for my Fiji life list. You can change it to your year list. Uh, you can change it to a month list and even a day list. So let's change it to my Fiji life list. Show target species. So these are the birds that I've never seen in Fiji that if I went in May, I'd be most likely to see. So 17.87% of the checklist have this bird on it. So it's a bird I could very likely see. Versus going all the way down where 0.14% have a leech of storm petrel. Very unlikely to see. You can click on the map and it'll show you where they're seen on Fiji for that time of year. These are all the points. So you can click on them and see where they were. So how about this Lagoon Resort had them that day. So we can go back from here. Explore regions. Let's look at California. This shows all the species that were seen in California recently. So this is by date. So this was the last scene. You can go by first scene. You can go by high counts. You can go by bar charts. Explore hotspots. The reddest hotspots over here have the most bird species in them, down to the lightest ones don't have many. If you know a hotspot name, you can put it in there. If you know a location, you can put it in there. So let's see, put Dane County, Wisconsin. So once again, the brightest red have the most bird species that have been at them. The lighter blues have the fewest. So one of the biggest hotspots in Dane County is actually Nine Springs Natural Area with 254 species. We can change this to Columbia. And we can see that Goose Pond is 218 species with 2,252 checklists. In addition, you can explore bar charts. So you can pick by state, by region, by county, by hotspots. So let's pick a hotspot. So let's go scroll down to Wisconsin. Let's go hotspots in Wisconsin. Go continue. These are every one of the hotspots in Wisconsin. So let's go to something oh, Buena Vista Grasslands. So we'll click on that, scroll down, hit continue. So this shows the frequency of each bird species for all the months and that's the week of each month is how this goes. So for instance, tundra swans are pretty much only there in April. Otherwise you don't see them any other months. Things like morning dove pretty much year round. 
Sandhill Crane from spring to late fall. Something like a Wilson's Fowler Rope is only being seen in July there. Lesser yellow legs, second week of May, and go down, etc. But American Crow, year round species, you'll see it on there all the time. So this is good to good to help you kind of search out an area and, and what's there when you're when you're gonna be there. So we'll go back to explore. How about we go to alerts? Click on alerts. So there's all kinds of alerts. You can do needs alerts. So let's just say I want to see any bird that I need for Dane County this year. So I click there. You can subscribe, which will send you an email, or you can view. So we'll say this year only versus lifetime. We'll hit view. So these are all the observations in the past seven days of birds that I haven't seen this year. So there's a couple blue winged teal, there's some ring neck pheasants, some glaucous gulls, uh, common loon, American white pelican, great blue heron, all the stuff I haven't seen. You can, you can see what day it was seen, when it was seen, where it was seen, and, and who saw it. You can also subscribe to it and make it an email. If you hit subscribe, you can do hourly or daily emails. So how about rare bird alerts? How about which, which birds are rare in Wisconsin? Just click that, we'll go view. So some of these are rare because of the location. So for instance, 30 greater white fronted geese in Door County is probably because it's a little early this year. Trumpeter swans, I just saw some this morning. Another reviewer has to review those, so I don't review my own. So that's still unconfirmed. Confirmed is anything a reviewer's looked at. Unconfirmed is anything we haven't looked at. Western Grebe right now in Ozaki County, they were seen in the last couple days. So they're both unconfirmed. You can see they have details. You can click on the details and see what they wrote. So this American Coot, for instance, the details, it has a photo on it. So you can drop down. There you can see there's a Coot sitting on the ice there. Uh, once again, it's probably because how far north it is. So it's not really rare in Dane County, but it's rare up in Green Bay area. You can also view this alert as an email hourly or daily. Uh, next, you have ABA rarities. These are for the whole ABA area. Just click on that. I don't want to subscribe to that. So these are birds that are normally pretty rare in the American Birding Association area. For instance, pink-footed goose here. We have a lot of those. They're very likely the same bird. Uh, barnacle goose. Gargany in, in California. A white cheek pintail in Florida, tufted duck in California. You can go through all the stuff that's that's rare to the ABA area on here. So we'll go back. So up top is my actual alerts. I have a needs alert for Dane County set up hourly. I have a rare birds alert for Dane County set up hourly, and I have a year needs alert for Dane County set up hourly. So I can go on here and change them. And change them to daily versus hourly and then save it. Uh, I can also unsubscribe from those alerts. So top 100, if you click top 100, you can look by county, state, province, country, all time, 2020, etc. So let's go Dane County for 2020 and you can do it by species or checklist. We'll do it by species. I'll show top 100 for species. So it shows I'm number 18 in the county this year with 84 species. Uh, the person with the most species this year is Neil Gilbert, who has 106 right now. The blue is if they have their profile public that we showed earlier. So you can click on Neil Gilbert there. You can see all his birds. You can see he's actually a regional reviewer for Orange County, California. You can zoom out and see where he's seen birds throughout the country and the world. If it's black, they don't have their profile set up. 
And if they're listed as an anonymous eBirder, they will not show on here. You won't be in the top 100. If you want to change it to buy checklist, you can go complete checklist, show top 100. Shows on number 45. This KK has 237 completed checklists, and it goes down from there. Uh, let's say you want to show all time for Dane County by species, show top 100. Shows that Aaron Stutz has 304 species for Dane County, K. Cavanaugh is 300, and so on and so forth. I'm number eight on there, down the list. So that's the top 100. Go back to explore. Yard totals, you have to set up your yard on here. I don't have my yard set up. You can go add a yard. You're going to have to kind of pick your area. And then anytime you submit birds from your yard, it'll show there. For this month, it looks like this Dan Jones has 94 species in his yard in Progresso Lakes, Texas. For life species, it's like Michael O'Brien in New Jersey has 284 species from his yard. He must have a pretty awesome yard there. So that's yard species. Patch totals, you also have to set up a patch. I think you can set up patches by seven and a half mile radius and a 15 mile radius. Uh, they can be anywhere. They don't have to be where you live. They can be where you bird most often. Go add a patch and do it from there. I don't do the patches. Some people find it fun. It's a nice little competition. So back to explore. After patch totals, then we have eBird Essentials, which is basically just classes on how to use eBird. You have the Merlin Bird ID, which is a nice little resource that'll help you ID birds. And then photo and sound quiz is just what it says. It's It pops up photos and sounds of birds and you have to identify what they are. Submission map, click on this. And this is showing real time as people are submitting checklists, you'll actually see little little lights pop up on the screen. So there's one right there that someone just submitted a checklist. So there's almost 17,000 checklists been submitted today. One just got submitted in Finland, you know, a couple in California here. It's just kind of cool to see as people are, are submitting checklists real time. Arrivals and departures. This is really good to help you understand migration around here. So for instance, we'll pick Wisconsin, Pick Dane County because this is where I live. Continue. This is showing arrival by species. I like to sort sort it by date. Anything on January first is probably year-round resident for the most part, unless there's a rarity that continued in the year. You can scroll down and see the first time species have been submitted in the county this year. So, for instance, the first horned grebe of the year I saw this week. There's first Glaucus gull of the year, common loon, mute swan, yellow rump warbler, and tree swallow were all the first of the year in, in the past week here. If you want to see in general arrival times, we can change it to 2019. Submit. And you can scroll down and kind of see right now we're March 20th. First tree swallow was just just reported a few days ago, as you can see. Uh, first horn grebe was just a few days ago. Our first osprey should be showing up in the next couple days. First great egret probably by the end of the week. First double crested cormorant next week. So you can kind of see when things are expected to arrive. At Ross's goose today, maybe a touch early. So this is good to help with migration when things are actually arriving around here. Broadwing hawk last year was April 13th. So in addition to arrivals, you can see departures. So this is good for fall migration. So you can see the last time that bird was seen. For instance, Laughing Gall was a one-day wonder in Dane County last year, so it was arrival and departure on the same day. Harris's Sparrow, there were no fall records, so the last one seen was May 9th. This is good for shorebirds. So if you look for, let's say, October was the last Dunlin on October 23rd. Last red eye Vero, October 17th, etc. 
And then you can see high counts, which is also nice to look at when you think you saw 10,000 of something, you can actually change this and, and take a peek. So I like to go by number. So there's only been one black belly whistling duck ever seen at a time. If you think you've seen two of them, you know, it's probably pretty rare. We'll sort it by high. So 5,000 Canada geese were the most ever seen at one time in 2019. 4250 red winged blackbird, just see for less, several years. So red winged blackbird had 10,000 is the most, sandhill crane 6150, Canada goose 5,000. You can see there's birds that have piles of numbers through here. So go back to explore. Uh, all time first class records. Go back to Dane County. So, this was the first time they were ever submitted in the eBird. Dunlin was from 1959 because we put records back in for several years. Evening Grosbeak, Dane County uh, in 1950. If you want to go last, most of them, unless they're rare, are going to be this year. So let's go. Last passenger pigeon report in Dane County was December 13th, 1875. A red fowler rope, 1899. Arctic tern, 1922. So it's cool to look at the records that way. Go back to explore. And we already covered high counts through the other part. So that's the last thing left on explore. I don't think there's anything else to cover on here. Thanks for listening in on my class. Have a good day.